Welcome to another special program on the Orthodox Christian Network. Sing to the Lord a new song, American Orthodox Music at St. Vladimir's Seminary Summer Music Institute. So there's still time for you to sign up and go to this either in person or virtually. Our special guests are Deacon Harrison Russin and Talia Sheehan. Welcome to both of you. It's nice to have you here today. Hello, Great to be here. Thank you. Many Orthodox Christians are familiar with different Orthodox sacred music. It's passed down to them through generations. There are music styles, but the possibility of creating new music is less than familiar. How is new music for the Orthodox liturgy developed? Who wants to take that one? I'll start, and okay, uh, I'll just mention by saying that uh, a few weeks ago we celebrated Saints Cyril Methodius, who are the apostles to the Slavs, and of course, in uh, <clears throat> many of the Eastern Slavic languages are, are written in the Cyrillic alphabet that's named after Saint Cyril, mm -hmm. and he, he was such a, a strong and devoted missionary for, for Christ that he invented this alphabet so that people could uh, read these services and, and perform these services and read the Bible in, in their own language. And I, I think that's a, a really strong foundation that we take as Orthodox Christians. And, and that's my tradition. My family is uh, Carpatho-Russian going back centuries and centuries. And we, you know, we have a strong devotion to St. Cyril Methodius. But in addition to the linguistic element, there is also a musical element that these apostles, and it wasn't just Cyril Methodius, there were many other apostles to the Slavic lands, brought music with them. And from what we can tell, we think that the earliest music that they sang was what we now call Byzantine chant. It was, it was from the Greek, uh, definitely from the Greek sphere. But over the course of a few centuries, it, it started to evolve. And it, it took on, a, we can say, an indigenous character, uh, mm -hmm. a, a local flavor. Uh, and uh, I, I think that's a, a very profound uh, statement that we have to honor within um, the, the history of Orthodox missions. We could see the same thing in Alaska. Alaska was yeah. missionized by the uh, by uh, Russian monks and, and priests in the uh, late 1700s and early 1800s. And today, Alaska has a very vibrant and distinct musical tradition. So there's something to be said of, of taking a tradition and uh, being part of that tradition, learning through that tradition, and then slowly, organically, it starts to grow, it starts to shift. So uh, I don't think either Tali or I would say just just leave everything behind, uh, start from scratch, and and we're gonna we're gonna write everything new. Uh, but to to both honor the tradition and to see how we can bring this into a a, a, a translation, let's say, translate the music, translate the words, and translate the music into a modern context. And I think that will uh, uh, ease some minds because I can see someone saying, well, what do you mean you're gonna throw everything out? No, uh, we're going to look at it. And by, by looking at it, learning from it and growing from it, that does not show disrespect. That shows actually a great deal of respect because that was the foundation, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Christianity, if anything, is a language of, is a religion of translation. We heard at first it was the word incarnate who became man. And then that's the pattern for the way Christianity has, you know, been brought to all of the souls around the world. That the, the language of the church is brought into a new place. And it is, it has to, to a certain extent, um, you know, in a sort of self-emptying way, give that initial language into the new language. And so the same thing happens with, um, with music, that that process of translation, almost, if you think about it, like a, a church hymn like it has to be translated into song every time it gets sung. And every new iteration of that song is almost like it's a, it's a new thing that was generated. So we're doing this all the time in church music. And also, if you think of this metaphor of a language, it's, it's apt um, in that you can't invent a language and suddenly have that communicate. It just, it, you can't. You can only use an existing language and change combinations of elements of it or, or come up with new, new ways to use existing pieces. And that's how a language evolves. And without that evolution or without that sort of incremental change that happens as people embody it and use it and communicate with it and love it, love it, love the language, the language dies. And so the same thing goes for our liturgical music, that if you're not using it and 
changing with it and letting it change with you, then it will die. And so that's what we're actually trying to do to continue to use and love this beautiful treasure that we've been given. Okay. Well, the program, from what I can understand, seeks to examine what American Orthodox music might look like. I don't expect us to answer that question today, but uh, can either of you speak a little bit about what it means for Orthodox music to be American? Sure. Well, I'll start because one of our featured composers is Talia's husband, Benedict. Okay. She and sh she might feel uh, self-conscious of tooting his own praises. <laughs> Uh, okay. No, no problem. I'm happy okay, to do okay. that all day long. <laughs> uh, Benedict is, is a fine example of this. He's, he's a young man. Uh, he's 43 now, Talia? Uh, yes. Good job. Yeah. 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 Um, so <laughs> so at least in, in uh, artistic age, very young. Um, I, I, well, I'm thinking of an interview that I listened to from Simon Rattle, the conductor, who said that no, no conductor is worth his salt until he's at least 70 years old <laughs> because wow. because he has he has nothing to say until he's there 70. Go. yeah that's good news <laughs> so um 43 is still very young, very young. Uh, and and uh benedict uh grew up within uh the orthodox tradition in america uh his his own father converted to the faith and and brought benedict and his family into the faith mm -hmm. uh, at um a, you know a very young age and mm -hmm. um so, so he had, you know, this, this profound experience growing up in the church, growing up in a small church in New Hampshire. Um, and then um, he also studied music professionally in college and in graduate school, and he studied theology uh, at seminary. So he has all of these different backgrounds and, and he's done um, most notably his, his composition and then recording performance of his divine liturgy. Uh, which was nominated for a Grammy, uh, is, is an incredible synthesis of all these different influences we can hear in his work. Um, and actually, a highlight of our institute this year, is we'll be singing his second composition of a divine liturgy, which uh, the first one was a grand piece over an hour long for a professional choir, or, or in some places, two choirs. Um, this, this version that we'll be singing uh, at the institute is, is actually approachable for a uh, an, an advanced, but still a, a, a non-professional parish choir. So we're excited for that. We also have uh, two more composers who are coming. One is Don Helene, who is a composer in residence at the Archdiocesan Cathedral, Greek Orthodox Archdiocesan Cathedral in Manhattan. And uh, another is Mother Catherine. So also both of them uh, are bringing uh, experiences uh, as um, people who are uh, you know new to the faith, converts to the faith, uh, but bringing a, a rich and profound musical experience. Uh, Atalia, you're, wel you're welcome to expand on that. Yeah, it's actually really exciting. Um, both Mother Catherine and Dawn are um, about to premiere their own full um, compositions, full settings of the Liturgy of St. John Chrysostom this year in the fall. Uh, Mother Catherine at the uh, National Conference of the Society of St. Moses the Black in Houston in October, and uh, Dawn's will be premiered at the uh, Federation of Greek Orthodox Church Musicians Conference in November in New York. And so it's going to be fabulous to be able to hear each of these three unique, creative, responsive sort of um, uh, conversations with these mm -hmm. composers, these artists, and and their creator, um, all in the in the words of Saint John Chrysostom. I, I do I do sort of feel like Saint John would, would be excited to hear all three of them. <laughs> He'll get to, um, but it's interesting, Father Christopher, that you ask what American Orthodox music would sound like, and and it's a question that very question, like those actual words, seem to be on people's lips rather a lot lately, and that was really the inspiration for our holding this conference because we felt like one of the best ways for us to begin to answer that question is just to ask each other mm. and to, to say, what do you think it sounds like? And then to be asked ourselves. And what we've arrived at really to a great extent is that as many different cultures as there are, Orthodox cultures in America, North America, in the West, those, those cultures, all of those hymns, all of those musical traditions, cultural traditions that are alive today in America, are American Orthodox choral music. Hmm. And the job we have as Americans is to hear each other. 
and to remember that we are all united in a communion and to understand that each tradition brings its own profound insights into the reality of lived faith and that we can learn so much from one another because of the great, great privilege that we have to be in a society where not one of those voices is silenced. And this is, this is our heritage as Americans and it's a tenuous one and we all know we're struggling with it kind of a lot as Americans right now. We seem to want to say this is right and this is wrong kind of across the board. But in the church, there's this infuriating sense of there not being any prescription for exactly what church singing is. And, you know, people have been searching through the texts of the fathers to try and find a justification for one or another artistic tradition for a long time. And it's just not there. And so basically what we arrive at is what sounds like church to you? And then what sounds like church to the people that you worship with? And how can you make that sound as true to your understanding of who Christ is and who you all are together as possible? And we come back to that language thing where you speak in the language that you have received and you make new combinations and you say interesting things and you express your own experience, but you use that language. So hopefully we'll find that American Orthodox music is what we're doing. All right. So we're talking about new music. Uh, we're obviously looking at actual theological teaching. We can't be going off the wall with some of this music. Uh, we're talking about bridges between traditions. Uh, I think an obvious question is when this comes about, who approves it? How do we know that this is, you know, blessed by God? I, I mean, how do you, how do you get to that point? You, you, have you thought that way? I, I think one um, perhaps useful analogy would be um, the attempts in the uh, in the Orthodox churches, at least in America. I don't know if this was a really a big thing in in Europe, um, but in in the 1960s and 70s to try to introduce a kiss of peace um, liturgically, uh, which uh, if if you go to a, for example a Roman Catholic church, they often will do a kiss of peace. Um, I forget. I, th I think before the creed is sim similar to us. Um, but it's um, it, it, that's something that just, in my experience, never really worked in an Orthodox church. And it, it, in most places, now I have been to some Orthodox churches where they still do this regularly, but it, in most places, in my experience, it's just kind of fallen out. Um, and, and I think that's one example we can look at as, as kind of something that was attempted to be maybe legislated by, by bishops or by theologians. Um, and... Uh, it just didn't work, right? It, it wasn't. It never really received the, the uh, let's say, seal of approval from from the Orthodox laity. Um, and uh, it, I think that's that's a similar analogy in in terms of who approves of church music. Um, I mean, we can have music legislated from bishops or from seminaries or from seminary professors, God forbid. Um, and if it's not approved you know if it doesn't really receive the uh approval of the people who are singing it who are worshiping with this music then i would say that 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 fails the, uh the approval that, that's a good analogy and the problem with the the so-called kiss of peace is something that was shared through clergy uh at the time uh, of um the creed and then leading into holy communion and uh you couldn't because that kiss of peace was done when the church was all male on one side, all female on the other side. And actually the actual tradition shows that they would, they were so pure because they were public confessions, they would literally kiss each other on the lips. Now, no one actually had that discussion in today's world to unpack that and say, okay, can that really work here? So I like what you're saying. It's, it's a matter of time and the time has a way of testing what we should do and what we shouldn't do. But I, I think that probably would be a question that some people would ask. Um, let me ask a different one. I'll go to Talia this time. Um, I know you're having special guests. Uh, I know that Benedict is there, Mother Catherine is there. Dawn Helene is there as well. Can you tell us a little bit about Dawn? Because I don't think we've discussed her yet. 
Sure. Um, Don has been the composer in residence at the uh, Holy Trinity Greek Orthodox Cathedral in New York City for some time now. Um, she is a musician by heritage and by training. Um, and she came to the cathedral um, in, I think it was 2016 or so, so not that long ago, um, okay. as a musician, as a professional musician, and found the Orthodox Church that way. And this is actually a really profound ministry that the Orthodox Church can provide to a lot of musicians who are who are seeking a home for their talents and um, their insights and that that maybe are wandering homeless and um, working in the professional world the way we do. There are a lot of extraordinarily dedicated church musicians who are are searching. Who are really who are really searching, um, and I know that was Dawn's path to finding the Orthodox Church. And even though that was not her cultural heritage, she has embraced it. And um, as the composer in residence, she regularly composes new settings, um, almost uh, weekly, um, that are sung in the services by the uh, cathedral choir. She's an accomplished organist as well, and um, composes uh, organ settings for, for the, some of these hymns, as is the tradition at that cathedral. Um, and so she really does bring this richness, like Harrison was saying earlier, the richness of her musical heritage and her insights and her background into the daily workings, you know, the routine um, workings of, of the cathedral there. Um, and so, uh, as such, she's kind of a representative of that translation process, and, and probably the most recent among our three guest composers. Benedict, as Harrison mentioned, came to the church as as basically a preschooler, um, and so remembers little yeah. else. Uh huh. Yeah, uh, Mother Catherine, um, I believe, as a young adult, um, but then Dawn just very recently. And so each of those three perspectives gives us really unique insights into how someone approaches the creative work of, of creating something new and offering it to the church, offering it generously with no uh, mandate that it be accepted, but just as, as you offer a dish to a house guest, um, you, you hope they like it, you put love into it, and, um, and you, know, you see whether or not when they come back again, they would like another, uh, another serving. <laughs> In an upcoming OCN interview with Mother Catherine on the Black American Orthodox experience, she discussed how using familiar melodies from the Black church tradition in America might build a bridge for those who connect with the theology of the church, but feel somewhat culturally disconnected. Um, do you see new Orthodox music in America and beyond as a, a potential tool for evangelism? Let me go to you first, Deacon. Yes, 100% yes. Um, the, the, the number of people, as, as Tali just mentioned with the story of Don, the, the number of people who uh, first come to love the church not because of uh, the people, not because of the gospel, not because of Jesus Christ, um, is, uh, it's because of the music. Uh, I remember I had a, a music professor in college who was a, a secular Jewish uh, person um, and you know, basically uh, agnostic or atheist. And he, he once told me, you know, if I had been raised in the Russian Orthodox Church, I never would have left religion because the music is so good. And <laughs> I think... Um, I, I think there, there is a lot of uh, a beauty that we can find in, in, in church music that brings people in. Um, so yes, uh, specifically with, with Mother Catherine and using uh, Black American uh, spirituals and uh, music from that tradition, uh, it, it really opens up, um, as, as Talia was saying, th this other way of, of um, uh, relating to people's experiences. Um, now, whether I've 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 actually sung some of her music in concerts that we've done with our, our choir at St. Vladimir's, mm -hmm. um, I have not used it liturgically. I've not sung her music liturgically, um, and again, that's that's fitting back into this puzzle piece of what is appropriate for our community. And at this point, um, I I think the music is is almost too new. It's it's right because when you when you hear, for example, the piece I'm thinking of is her setting of. Um, Oxyonestine. It is truly uh, meat to, to bless you, O Theotokos. Um, and she actually sets that to the to the black spiritual. Were you there when they crucified our Lord? Oh. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Um, 
And uh, I, for me, and I think for a lot of other people, there are just too many overtones uh, when you combine that music with that text um, that it would, um, it would almost cause, for me, it would cause like a meltdown, uh, like, like a, a mental meltdown in, in, the, in the liturgy. As a concert piece, I, I, I love it and I adore it. Um, but I, I think um, that's one example of, of having room for integrating um, music that perhaps is beyond um, or, or, or counter to people's expectations and, and fitting it in with, with a text that we are uh, familiar with as Orthodox Christians. We know too that the senses are the windows into the soul, right? Yes. So if you're hearing that music, it, it should move you. It should lift the hair off your arm, if you will. Uh, Talia, let me come to you for a minute. What skills can participants in this program expect to lead with? Yeah, um, it's so interesting. The process of learning um, a new hymn really does bring, you have to bring to the, um, to the table a lot of musical skills. And I think that's one of the reasons why there's a little bit of friction about trying to solve problems musically in the church because there, um, there are challenges involved with um, updating or refining a musical tradition. Um, and you know, we call that opportunity cost. How much is it gonna cost to solve this problem? Mm -hmm. And you know, I live and work at St. Chicon's Monastery with my husband, Benedict. And one of the uh, challenges that we face here is the, the issue of a high rate of iteration. I'll put, it, I'll put it that way. We just have to serve the services so often and for so long that we encounter problems more quickly here than a parish community might. Literally three services a day, every day of the year for 119 years or however long it's been. Um, so uh, in that circumstance, problems become bigger quicker and you need better solutions more quickly. And so one of the things that we have found is the possibly one of the best solutions is to just learn how to do what you're doing better so that you yourself can represent one of the solutions to the problem. And so literacy, music literacy, because it's very hard to convey a musical tradition um, uh, quickly. Music notation is actually, it's a kind of a shorthand for a long lived experience of being a musician. So you can either have spent your entire childhood and maybe your parents can have spent their entire lives and maybe your grandparents even in a musical tradition so that you know that musical content in your blood almost, or you can look at the transcribed abstracted musical notation of that tradition and reproduce it from that abstraction. Now, there's been a perennial argument that notation is reductive. You lose the spirit of the performance. There are things that notation cannot convey. And obviously that's true. It's very difficult to convey style in notation. But notation does allow for the dissemination of, of unique musical traditions much, much more quickly than we would have to rely on if we were just doing oral, the oral transmission of a musical tradition, just be in church and learn the songs. Mm. So we are really trying to emphasize that tool as the first one that people should pick up if they're trying to merely even improve the state of their worship music in their community, mm -hmm. to improve literacy, and then be able to more precisely uh, perform or, or incarnate, let's go back to that metaphor we used earlier, each of the hymns in the services. So we will be focusing on some musicianship skills and that obviously we'll have to use because we'll be sight reading original compositions that no one will have had a chance to, you know, be exposed to for a long time and just learn by ear. Um, and then on top of that, in order to uh, really understand where these composers are coming from, we will be kind of at looking, taking a close look at their creative process. And one of the interesting things about, um, about an artistic tradition, and I think Father Christopher, as you were asking who approves these things, um, is the question of, of who has the agency to create them in the first place. And one of the you know, difficult things I think for us as, as modern people to accept is that it's actually, there, there isn't an institution that creates these things. There wasn't, the church did not write the hymnography. Hymnographers. Individuals, creative individuals wrote the hymnography with the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The monks from the monks, did and not monasteries, the monks and monasteries around the world. Yes, that's yeah. the thing. Yeah. yeah, those were just creative people who had artistic skill and who wanted to serve and glorify God 
through that artistic skill. Mm -hmm. And so what it looks like to be the individual creative person who is trying to contribute to this like millennia old tradition of worship um, is sometimes really precarious. You have to have a certain kind of boldness and a certain kind of um, uh, sort of uh, brashness almost to be able to say, I have an idea. And that idea may or may not be a, a, adopted, but you still have to have that courage to say, I have an idea and then, and then put it forth. And so these three composers are going to be modeling that for our participants. So you can just see what it's like for three different people to approach that very naughty problem. Very so that's one of the things yeah. most excited about. That's very interesting. And I, and I'm, and I recall from the gospels that uh, I must become less so that he may become greater. So I don't think and I don't see it in either of you or probably any of these other people that we're looking at um, promoting a personality. That's a very dangerous, dangerous way to go. We know that today through social media, that the personalities are really a zero end. But this is very exciting what you're doing. And uh, I love the fact that you're glorifying God through this. Uh, Deacon, I want to ask you one final question, that is, how can viewers and listeners participate? I mean, I wish I was like a fly on the wall during all these discussions, because it sounds tremendous. I can't sight read, I can't do that, but just to listen would be great. So, Deacon, in closing this exciting interview today with the wonderful work you and Talia are doing with your staff there and with those people you've invited, how can viewers listen and participate in this wonderful conference? Sure. So if you go to uh, the St. Vladimir's website, which is svots.edu, you'll find a, a link there on the main page for registering for the Summer Music Institute. There is, uh, so, so let me get the dates, uh, because I don't think we've, we've mentioned that yet. So it begins on Monday, June 19th, okay. and it ends on Saturday, June 24th. And the first two days, uh, Monday and Tuesday of that week, are actually limited to small classes. And we only have a handful of spots. I think we only have three spots left for those. Uh, so if you're interested in that, hurry up and register because that's almost sold out. The rest of the week, beginning Tuesday night and then ending on Saturday morning, will be devoted to, as Talia mentioned, working on these musicianships, musicianship skills, uh, rehearsing Benedict's like liturgy setting, and then being in conversation with our guest composers. Um, and uh, there is also, as, as you mentioned at the beginning, Father Christopher, uh, a hybrid or uh, a virtual audit option. Mm -hmm. And uh, you could register for that as well on the St. Vladimir's website. And we have a special coupon code for listeners of uh, Orthodox Christian Network. And that coupon code is simply OCN. And that will give you a 20% discount on either the virtual audit or the in-person Tuesday through Saturday option. And what is the actual cost of the conference? So the, um, the including meals, uh, the actual cost for the in-person is $380. That's without the discount. And the actual cost for the virtual is $150 without the discount. Does that include room and board or not? I mean, the board, yes, but the room? Rooming, no. Unfortunately, we can't house people on campus. So uh, there are hotel options on it and we list those on our website. You list those. Okay. Well, folks, uh, I hope you've enjoyed this conversation as much as I have. And please, uh, if you can attend physically, get there. Uh, if you can't, then do it virtually, and let's learn about this wonderful program, and may God bless this effort to bring about the Holy Spirit's blessing upon all of the work that is being done in our churches. Obviously, through the hymns and through the beautiful words of our hymns, we're able to glorify God. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Let's put our faith there. Thank you.